As the second theme of the course, we will consider linear regression and particularly the classic ordinary least squares estimate or OLS. So as you, it's probably apparent that, uh, already that uh, econometrics is uh, very much uh, focused on the or based on the on the linear regression. So uh, we start with the with the classical treatment before we go to the to this kind of uh, um, econometric uh, development such as instrumental variables or or uh, more advanced techniques like time series or panel data. And uh, in this first lecture, I will I will start with uh, considering the single regression model, and I want to clarify a little bit what happens in the computer when you are running a regression. So, so far, we have considered the example of the hedonic housing market in the single, single regression case. So we had just a single explanatory variable, the size in square meter. And I noted that it's possible to run this regression, for example, by simply adding a trend line in, in Excel. So if you add a linear trend line, uh, what happens then is that Excel uh, computes the, the ordinary least squares estimate uh, of the of the line, so it it fits the de this uh, trend line by by OLS to the scatter of data points. So uh, to understand uh, the statistical properties and to understand what is the the uh, econometrics about, I believe it's very important to have a little bit understanding also what is happening in the computer when you run the regression. So it's not like uh, you press the button that there is some kind of a miracle happens or some kind of mystical mystical things happening uh it's very clear that like, what the, what the, what the computer is doing to calculate these numbers and this is what i want to clarify first in the case of a simplest case of the of the single regression okay so to pave a wave to the to the further discussion of the statistical properties i want to already at this stage make a clear distinction between the theoretical regression model and the estimated model. So like a common practice in statistics, I will use these uh, Greek uh, alphabets, betas and epsilons uh, to characterize the parameters and the random variable epsilon of the, of the theoretical model. So the intercept term beta one and the slope beta two of the, of the theoretical regression model are indicated with these Greek, uh, uh, Greek letters. The idea here is that uh, you cannot ever actually actually uh, directly observe those uh, those uh, anything that uh, that is denoted by these Greek alphabets. Okay, so this is something that is beyond uh, beyond our observation. However, this is something that we are interested in. So we believe that this is something that is uh, uh, that is characteristics uh, what's happening in the real world. So this is this betas are something out there but we cannot directly, uh, directly observe them. So what we can do when we have this uh, data of X and Y, so keep in mind again that X and Y are not uh, some, some uh, unknowns to be solved, X and Y are actually data that we do observe. So given our sample of data, we can then actually estimate, uh, uh, we, can, we, can, we can calculate some estimates for this, uh, these uh, coefficients beta. But these estimated parameters, we will then refer to with this Latin alphabet. So B1 and B2, they refer to this, what we have estimated from data. And when we discuss uh, the statistical properties, the question is then how well our estimates, uh, so this B1 and B2, how well those are, those are estimating those true but unknown and underlying betas. Also, uh, in terms of terminology, it's important to clarify here perhaps that uh, this epsilon, we will refer to epsilon as the error term, whereas this uh, E is called residual. So this is something worth writing down. Unfortunately, I don't have it yet in these slides. So E is the regression residual and epsilon is called the error term. This is very important distinction. So never ever call epsilon the residual or vice versa never call this e as a as an error term this is like a clear terminology in the context of regression analysis and also i want to highlight already here uh, that uh, 
if given this kind of theoretical model, there are many different ways of, of calculating these estimates. Uh, Ordinary least squares is the classical estimation technique. So, so very often when people talk about linear regression, they actually take like OLS as, a, as the sort of default assumption. But there is also other ways of fitting a, fitting a regression line to a data. We could do, for example, least absolute deviations or LAD. There is uh, maximum likelihood estimation. We, we will also later on uh, consider maximum likelihood uh, in this course. We will also consider briefly generalized method of moments or GMM. So if you if you read econometric literature, you might encounter also some of these other things. And uh, it's worth to understand that uh, that uh, these are in some sense alternative uh, principles to fit uh, the regression line. In some contexts, uh, some of these are better than others. And it's also also good to understand, OK, in which context uh, maximum likelihood would be better than OLS or which context uh, it's the only alternative, perhaps. And what, what are the advantages of GMM? So uh, at this point, it's already good to know that there are alternatives to ordinary least squares. So it's not the only possibility to fit the line to the data. But uh, this is the uh, most classical approach going back to the Carl Friedrich Gauss when Gauss was uh, uh, trying to uh, estimate the uh, orbits of planets based on some, some astronomical observations. So, so he was using ordinary least squares already several hundreds of years ago. And, uh, and uh, this is widely used in many, many, many other, other areas as well. So my purpose in this, uh, in this uh, lesson is then to check, okay, how does this ordinary least squares operate? So in practice, what does your computer do? When you when you fit the regression line to the data, so all of those alternatives that I mentioned on the previous slides, they have some kind of principle how they how they fit the data to the like. And, and the name of ordinary least squares comes from the fact that the 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 in this method we are minimizing the sum of squares of uh, residuals e. And uh, I have formally stated here this optimization problem on this slide. So the purpose is to minimize the, the sum indicated by sigma. And we take sum over these residuals EI and, and we take, take this EI to power two and then sum over all observations I. And uh, the, we have constraint indicated by this ST. So ST refers to subject two constraint that uh, that uh, these um, we need to fit this kind of uh, regression line b1 plus b2 times x and uh, plus this kind of residual term e to fit exactly to this uh, observed yi and so so in this way we are minimizing the variance of uh, or sample variance of the residuals and with that sense uh, this principle let us fit the regression line as closely as possible to this uh, this uh, scatter plot of, of data recall that this is in the case of a single single x variable only so um, i have indicated this objective function with symbol rss so that would be abbreviation for residual sums of squares and we will later use also this rss in the in the in the next few lessons so I have noted here that uh, that minimizing the sum of squares of residuals, we are actually minimizing the sample variance of uh, of residuals. So if you recall the formula of the sample variance, um, we could just divide this objective function by constant n minus one. That wouldn't affect anything. And another thing is that uh, uh, it's actually a, one of the properties that the optimal solution of this uh, minimization problem always has the the average value of the residual is equal to zero. So in fact, then we are minimizing the sample variance of, of residuals. So then if you, if you think about a little bit the, the, the constraint optimization, so we could, for example, form the Lagrangian and then start to differentiate. But the minimization becomes uh, considerably easier if we notice that um, that if we take the constraints 
we can actually solve out the residual EI and express this EI as the difference between the observed uh, dependent variable YI minus uh, the predicted value of Y. So prediction would be this uh, uh, B1 plus B2 times X. So if we subtract this prediction, we will have uh, the residual as the difference between the observed Y and its prediction. Okay. So next, if we then take this EI and substitute it to the objective function, Notice that we can then we can eliminate this residual EI and then simply minimize the squared values of uh, YI minus B1 minus B2 times XI raised to power 2 and then summing over all observations I. So this way we have not only eliminated one of the unknown variables, which is the residual EI, but also we have, we have now converted this constraint optimization problem to an unconstrained problem. And, and obviously this kind of unconstrained minimization problem is much easier to, uh, easier to solve. So then as the next step, let's remember how do we minimize some, some uh, function with, uh, with two unknown variables. And again, I want to emphasize that here, X and Y are just observed data. We have two unknowns and the unknowns are the intercept B1 and uh, slope B2. So how do we minimize some kind of a function with two variables? So now, of course, uh, it has many, many terms because we have this kind of sum over, over different I terms, but this B1 and B2 are just constants. And we can then differentiate our objective function. So we can take our RSS, what we want to minimize, and we can calculate the partial derivatives with respect to the two unknowns. Namely, we can take partial derivative with respect to the B1. So this is the first of the first order equations. And having calculated this partial derivative, we set it equal to zero. Then because we have two unknown variables, we also need to differentiate this objective function RSS with respect to the other unknown, which is this coefficient B2 the slope coefficient. So we take the partial derivative of RSS with respect to B2 and set this partial derivative equal to zero. So this will give us this kind of system of two equalities. And if the, if the problem is well, beha well behaved, like it, it turns out to be in this case, then the optimal solution is found as a solution to these two first order conditions. Okay. So this is uh, just a uh, basic optimization when we have this kind of uh, uh, kind of continuous uh, objective function with respect to two unknown variables. So this, of course, requires that uh, that uh, that the global optimum is found as in the first order solution to the first order conditions uh, requires that this is a, this is a objective function is is uh, is uh, convex, sorry, concave. Ah, so we want to minimize, so it should be convex, yes. So, so, and this actually turns out to be the case because we have this kind of quadratic uh, objective function. So before going to the first order conditions, I want to also then a little bit reorganize the objective function. So uh, this will look like a little bit perhaps scary at first, but uh, it will make actually this uh, differentiation much easier. So I want to, uh, I want to write out this uh, squared value of this, uh, this, uh, this residual. So in the first line, we have expressed this uh, uh, objective function as before, but then I just take this uh, uh, squared value of this uh, yi minus b1 minus b2 times x. So, so then we have, uh, for example, yi to power 2, then we need to raise b1 to power 2, and so on and so on. So uh, I don't walk you through all of these steps, but it's a good idea to, to look at the slides and, and check that you can understand and follow the steps. So in the first part, First step, I simply simply uh, write out this uh, this uh, this uh, squared expression, 
explicitly by component by component. And then it's the second step. I then use the properties of the sigma operator. So it's the sum operator sigma, and I will then uh, move the sigma operator to each of these uh, components. So if you don't understand one of these uh, parts, then then it's good to check back this uh, properties of the sigma operator. So there's nothing nothing uh, very mystical happening here, or everything is uh, clear with this uh, this uh, properties of the sigma operator. And please verify that you can you can get this RSS to this uh, form uh, at the bottom of this uh, this development. Okay. So then we are ready to differentiate. So then next thing, I will go and and I will take uh, the partial derivative uh, of the objective function RSS with respect to uh, B one, which is the intercept. And now it is good to remember the, the derivative rules. So remember that for the partial derivative, uh, when we differentiate with respect to B1, then everything else is considered to be constants. We only care about B1. <clears throat> and uh, to this end, and the first line, I have highlighted this uh, uh, variable B1 by red color. Okay, everything indicated by red are variables and everything with black color are just treated as if they were constants. So when we differentiate then, so for example, when we have this uh, sum of uh, yi to power two, because this component doesn't include any b1, so the partial derivative is simply zero and that drops out. The second term is n times a b12 okay so here we have now this uh, b1 indicated by red color so we need to differentiate with respect to b1 and uh, you can then verify using the rules of uh, derivative that uh, the the derivative is 2 times n times b1 and so on and so on i don't go through every and each and every step so you can verify then that the partial derivative is uh, uh, what is stated on the second line here. So this partial derivative of the objective function with respect to B1 is equal to 2 times N times B1 minus 2 times the sum of Yi plus 2 times B2 times the sum of Xi. And this partial derivative we need to set equal to 0 to find the optimal solution to B1. So now if we then, then uh, solve B1 out of this, uh, this uh, first order condition, so I have then indicated with this, this uh, arrow to both directions. So if we then take uh, B1 on the left-hand side of the equation and move everything else to the right-hand side of the equation, we will get that uh, B1 must be equal to the sum of uh, Yi divided by N minus b2 times uh, xi divided by n. Okay, so that's very, very simple. Notice that this, uh, this, uh, this uh, 2 will cancel out because it is included in all of this, uh, this uh, each, each of these three components in the first order condition. So on purpose, I have here then highlighted this uh, uh, sum of yi divided by n by green color and a sum of xi divided by n by blue color, because there is very well-known interpretation for this kind of sum, sum divided by n. So obviously the green colored element we can interpret simply as the, as the sample average of y. And I have indicated this green sample average by y upper bar. That's the common notation in statistics. And similarly, uh, notice that this uh, element in, in indicated by blue color. So, so if we have take sum over xi and we divide it by n, then this is simply the sample average of x. And this is then I have indicated this blue by, by, by x upper bar, which is common notation for the sample average. So taking it this way, then, then we can calculate b, one, so the optimal 
uh, solution to the ordinary least squares uh, problem is to set this uh, intercept B1 equal to the sample average of Y minus B2 times sample average of X. So if you think about it, uh, uh, we could also reorganize it uh, in a different way. So we could say that the sample average of Y is equal to B1 plus B2 times sample average of X. So this result implies that it's always uh, optimal to set the intercept so that uh, the, the regression line passes through the sample average. So if you think about the scatter plot of data that we started with, uh, if you find uh, a point where, this, uh, where we have the sample average of X and sample average of Y and put it in this, uh, in this kind of uh, two-dimensional coordinate system, then the regression line fitted by OLS will always pass through this sample average point. This is this kind of solution to the first order optimal condition. We'll imply that. So we have now solved this, uh, this B1 and actually it turns out to be that it's, it's very simple. We just need to calculate the sample average of X and sample average of Y. And given that we have the slope B2, we can calculate B1. So notice that of course this uh, uh, intercept and slope are interdependent. So B1 here depends on, on B2. So what about B2 then? How can we, how can we fit, find this uh, slope coefficient B2 intercept? also depends on the slope. So for that purpose, then we need to consider the second partial derivative. And again, this uh, derivation might look a little bit scary, but uh, please don't get scared immediately if you see such kind of uh, complicated uh, formulas. It's actually not so complicated as it might first seem. So no panic, just uh, take, a, take a breath and, uh, and, uh, and take some time to walk through this, uh, this formulas. Everything is actually fairly clear. And I'll try to also elaborate a little bit. So remember that uh, for the optimizing this RSS, the objective function, we needed to take the partial derivatives with respect to both two unknowns. We already did it for this B1. And also another unknown we have is, is B2. So this is what I have done next. So, so I take the objective function and uh, now we take partial derivative uh, with respect to the slope B2. So now I have indicated with the red color everything in the objective function that includes B2. And again, remember that everything else is treated as if it was just constants. Okay. So again, for example, in this, in this, uh, expression for the objective function, we had the sum of uh, yi to power two. But this element still, or this component still doesn't include any B2. So the partial derivative is equal to zero for that element. And that applies to every other element that doesn't include B2, including this n times B1 to two. So even though B1 is an unknown, but when we take partial derivative with respect to B2, we treat this n times B1 to power two as a constant. And therefore, uh, its partial derivative is, is zero. So again, I don't go through all of these uh, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, six different uh, components of the sum. So if you, if you remember the rules of derivatives and you differentiate with respect to B2, which I have already indicated with the red color, you can verify that, uh, that the partial derivative is equal to two times B2 uh, times the sum of, of uh, x i to power two minus two times the sum of the product of x i and x i plus two times b one times the sum of x i. And like before, we can we can simply eliminate this uh, this two which is which is just a constant, and we set this uh, this equation equal to zero. So I have also a little bit already reorganized this expression. So uh, notice that, um, that uh, or, or remember from this, uh, this um, previous slide that we can, we can take this uh, B1, an optimal solution to B1 was uh, 
to set b1 equal to the sample average of y, which was this y upper bar, minus b2 times x upper bar. So this is the way that when I plug in this b1 already in this, uh, in this first order condition, then we have an equation that only includes the unknown b2. So remember again that, of course, this b1 and b2 depend on each other. But since we already solved out b1, then we can plug in this b optimal b1 to this equation for b2. So then we have this expression that includes now only b2 and on the right hand side we have zero. So the, then we can solve this equation in terms of b2. So we move b2 on the left hand side of equation and move everything else on the right hand side of the equation. So we can verify this step that, uh, that uh, then that, uh, that b2 is equal to the sum of xi times yi minus n times the sample average of x and y. And this expression we need to divide by uh, the sum of xi to power 2 minus n times uh, the sample average x upper bar to power 2. This is easy to verify from this previous equation when we solve the equation with respect to b2 and move everything else to the, to the right-hand side of the equation. So it's just basic math that you have done in, in, in the secondary school already. So now it's maybe not so straightforward to see uh, when we have, I'm now on this bottom row of the slide. So I have, I have already explained that b2, we solved out that, that it is this uh, first ratio. So now I also developed this, this ratio a little bit further and notice that, uh, that uh, this is maybe not so easy to observe directly, but we can break down also this sum in this way that, that we can think about the, what would be the sum if we take uh, xi minus x upper bar in parentheses and multiply that with the difference of yi minus y upper bar in parentheses. So I think it's easier to work the the opposite way. So if, if you know the result, it's easy to verify that this, uh, this, uh, this product of xi minus x upper bar and yi minus y upper bar is equal to xi minus yi, sorry, xi minus yi minus uh, n times x upper bar and, and y upper bar. And on the denominator, we can then also express this, uh, this sum as xi minus x uh, upper bar to power 2. So then, as the final step, what we want to do is then, I want to also then, then uh, note that, okay, if we then divide both nominator and denominator by n minus 1, then actually we can interpret this uh, uh, nominator of this ratio as the sample covariance of x and y. And I have indicated this uh, sample covariance with the symbol estcov. So it's like estimated covariance. That's what I refer to this sample covariance. And in a denominator, we have sample variance of x. And I denote that by estvar x. So I will utilize this notation also later on, and I come back to that. But that's actually quite quite a nice and compact uh, finding. So if you go through these all these uh, little bit tedious looking derivations, then actually what happens is we have uh, proven that uh, uh, ordinary least squares estimator in the case of a single x variable has this kind of uh, uh, compelling interpretation, namely this uh, slope coefficient is simply the sample covariance of x and y divided by sample variance of x. So this is why the linear regression is very closely also related to the, to the correlation analysis. So if you think about correlation coefficient of, of uh, two random variables, x and y, uh, it can be seen as the, as the, or the sample correlation coefficient is just the sample covariance normalized by the product of the standard deviations of x and y. So in some sense, the slope coefficient in the regression line is very closely related to the, to the correlation coefficient because that's also just sample covariance of x and y, but now we normalize it with respect to the sample variance of x rather than uh, product of sample 
standard deviations. And also recall that the, the intercept uh, is then uh, dependent on this uh, slow estimated slope B2 and the, and the, and these uh, uh, sample averages of Y and X. So even though we started with this kind of uh, constrained optimization problem, when you run linear regression, actually your computer doesn't need to solve some kind of optimization problem. It can use this kind of ready known, well-known uh, closed form solution. So actually what your computer is doing this is then computing sample covariances, sample variances and, and uh, sample averages. Nothing, nothing more mystical than that. So, so again, I repeat, when your computer is running linear regression, what it does is it calculates just some sample covariances, sample variances, and, and uh, uh, sample averages. And it can utilize this kind of well-known uh, well optimal solutions. There's no need to optimize anything every time you run a regression. And uh, these kind of well-known Optimal properties also are very useful starting point when we consider then statistical inferences. So it's also good to highlight this fact that uh, whenever you run a regression, there's nothing mysterious happening. There's no magic. There's no, no nothing random about it. Also, every time you run a regression, you get this kind of uh, computer is using some known formula and calculates it exactly the same. If you run the regression again your computer is getting exactly the same result each and every time with the given data. So there's nothing random about this, how your computer is calculating the regression coefficients. Okay, that's good to keep in mind when we consider the, the, the statistical properties. So there's nothing random, nothing mysterious about these coefficients. So as the next topic is then, I will also then continue still at this kind of relatively mechanical level, but extend to the multiple regression model. Thanks. Bye-bye.